all right guys so day four week four and uh, let's uh, go ahead uh, so we're just gonna log in from our machine three and four we need to do the live migration we need to check how machines are migrated from one hypervisor to another okay so last time we were able to do import export right and uh, now we need to do that uh, migration so uh, to move VMs from one hypervisor to another hypervisor um, and uh, in order to do that uh, there are different types of migration but why would you even want to migrate virtual machines from one hypervisor uh, to another so there are many reasons here um, and uh, if we go ahead with those one by one so what happens here is suppose you have uh, uh, the four machines here so the last two last two are right now hypervisors and that's uh, your first name 03 and your first name 04 So if you have uh, local disks here, local disk, right? So uh, we have local disks here and uh, local physical disk. And uh, this supposes a local physical disk here. And uh, this is your uh, hypervisor one and hypervisor two uh, named hypervisor uh, hypervisor not the type I'm not uh, referring to the type here so these are right now for the tools if you go for the type so these are the two hypervisors now you when you create a virtual machine what happens is uh, that uh, it asks for where to put the virtual disk of a virtual machine here right so uh, obviously because we don't have SAN we don't have SAN which is what is SAN Storage Radio Network and uh, what does it do? What's the purpose of that? Storage Radio Network, what's the purpose of that? It's a vending machine. It's uh, this what? Mark? So Storage Radio Network is providing uh, storage over the network right so uh, if I just go for a uh, diagram here for SAN so SAN and EMC so if I go for pictures here <coughs> so storage network has a lot of devices that has rows and rows and rows of disks right so uh, these devices the only purpose of these devices is to provide disk space that uh, you know small companies can't afford that uh, it would be made into large size companies having 10,000 up to 100,000 200,000 users uh, who would be able to afford that so uh, 50,000 100,000 dollar or 200,000 dollar solution or even half a million solution uh, half a million dollar solution so it is providing disks now why do we need disks we already have disks in our hypervisors right so suppose uh, uh, your boss says okay we need 10 terabytes so okay why not go to the market and purchase those disks one terabyte each 10 disks you can put there uh, and you got 10 terabyte right so uh, the boss says no uh, actually I need uh, 100 disks each one terabyte now when you say 100 disks now that's not physically possible uh, in a server in one server well uh, I've heard about having 60 disks in one uh, physical server but uh, maybe it's, it has reached 100 as well so uh, suppose it's uh, IBM server right so that would be just uh, either a rack server like this or uh, uh, a tower server like this but uh, having 64 disks inside maybe it's uh, as big as this uh, and you might want to these are all the disks right hardly 10 12 disks here but if you have rows and rows of disks sometimes there's a big server that you can have a tray uh, you can take out the tray and then 
there's rows and rows and rows and rows and of this. So uh, then uh, it is like 64 disks that could physically put. Suppose uh, somebody says that, okay, in our server we need 200 disks here. So that's not possible now. Physically it's not possible, right? So if you need 200 disks here, then you need SAN or NAS. So SAN would be storage area network and uh, NAS is cheaper network attached storage right so it would be cheaper to purchase even if you go to Canon computers or Best Buy now you can uh, purchase NAS it's like two disks and two disks and two disks and they're all in uh, RAID 1 uh, configuration so if one disk goes down still other disk can keep your data safe so uh, network attached storage right so uh, normally this is of course very expensive but oh, obviously more reliable and when you join the company as a virtualization admin or a cloud admin uh, so you would see SAN already there for medium large size companies having big budgets there so NAS can be storage uh, it also can provide uh, storage over the network but for small companies uh, and so this is what we wanted to know first of all um, now what we are doing is it's just a training environment what's supposed to happen is when we create a virtual machine its virtual disk should be actually created on SAN over the network normally what happens is suppose your uh, uh, hypervisor 3 need 200 disks and that's like uh, maybe uh, 100 terabyte or uh, 200 terabyte you need a huge amount of space there right then every disk is SSD as well right like super slow drive no sorry straight drive so uh, every disk is SSD and it is in SAN so what happens is you are supposed to map as many disks as you can as you want for any of the hypervisors right you can map these disks over the network your network better be good then uh, fiber optic networks or uh, just ethernet land network that you have right now so you can connect over the network these disks to these two hypervisors right so uh, the same disk is here connected remote storage and same disk is here connected when i say same here it is accessible from uh, hypervisor 3 the same exact disk is accessible from hypervisor 4 as well and what's the significance of that what is the benefit of that same disk you have made available in 3 and made available on 4 right now we don't have that kind of setup but this this would be our ideal setup and these would be the horrible questions with a lot of twists there that I'm going to be putting in midterm and final term so uh, you know uh, you would be there at that time googling or you know you'd be going for those slides uh, they're not going to be written as statements I'm just going to ask what is a concept of anything right so um, well good luck recognizing that so if you understand now maybe you, would, uh, you will be able to answer but otherwise it's uh, you know made to be tricky let's see it's going to be open book so you will have each other's support I guess um, but good luck with that support <coughs> so the main thing is if you don't understand uh, it's you won't be able to give the exam or it's not going to be with uh, good marks so um, here if you put a disk here that is called a one or logical unit number right one so this is these are all uh, disks or lines here that would be available as remote storage what is the line logical unit number but ultimately what does it mean in English uh, so it means that these are rem disks that have been provided remotely from SAN and uh, uh, what is the significance of that so when you're creating a virtual machine here that virtual machine uh, has to be created not on a local disk that's unprofessional or that maybe small companies should do that uh, but you should be creating those virtual disks on uh, uh, LUNs here that are coming from over the SAN. But what is the benefit of that? What is the disadvantage of having the local disk created on a, a, a virtual disk of a virtual machine created on a local physical disk here? And what is the advantage of creating the virtual disk of a virtual machine on a LUN that is coming from SAN? 
Anyone knows that? What is the difference? What is the advantage or disadvantage of that? If we create a virtual machine whose all virtual files are on a local physical disk here, suppose the whole hypervisor goes down. So you have no access now to that uh, virtual machine. And also, maybe it's down or the hard disk is uh, not available anymore. So you lost your data as well. But if you created your virtual machine, virtual machine's virtual disk on top of a storage that is coming from over the network from somewhere else, from a SAN, what happens is that if the hypervisor now goes down, uh, the virtual machine's virtual disk was never there on this hypervisor, right? It was there on a one which is remote disk that is actually available on SAN. So when you create a virtual machine's virtual disk on one here, you're actually creating that here in SAN, right? So this means if the hypervisor goes down, your virtual disk is still safe. What's the big deal with virtual disk? So what if the virtual disk is lost? Well, a virtual disk has all the data that the company is working on and the company is earning millions, suppose, from that data that is in the virtual disk, right? So that virtual disk is inaccessible, employees cannot work on that data and they cannot uh, interact with the clients. So a company might be losing millions of dollars or thousands of dollars per minute, per hour. So that virtual disk has to be on such a storage that is highly available, right? If it is on storage that is not highly available, uh, then uh, you know this means you didn't set up the network correctly, or you don't know much about high availability and disaster recovery, right? So when you are employed as a system admin or virtualization admin or cloud admin uh, in uh, IT uh, companies there or IT departments of any company, so the main thing is that you should know that if you have SAN, you have high availability of virtual machines and their disks. If you don't have SAN, then you have to create your virtual machines virtual disk on the local physical disk if the uh, local physical disk uh, is part of, of course it's part of the hypervisor if hypervisor goes down you have no access uh, but if uh, hypervisor goes down while your virtual disk is on one that is attached to a SAN so this means your disk is still safe uh, somewhere else it is being accessed from hypervisor 3 but it is safely present somewhere else on SAN, right? So uh, you just have to make SAN highly available, obviously. So when you spend $100,000, $200,000 uh, just on the SAN solution, obviously it is highly available. It makes sure that uh, if one uh, one goes down, that the other one still has the data with you. So that's uh, what we are trying to create here. Last week we uh, created virtual machines. Uh, before that we created virtual machines. So virtual machines are still, what we are doing is we are creating virtual machines here in our local physical disk. We do not have SAN here. We're gonna later create a virtual SAN, a software SAN. So we could understand the concept of SAN, right? And then how, how availability really works. So uh, what we have here now is just local disk. But that's the one thing that, okay, um, we don't have SAN, so we have a virtual machine that has its virtual disk created on a local physical disk, not on a LAN, that is, that is a disk that is coming from SAN, right? So LAN is for, is equals to, so I'm just going to put that there. Maybe I'll ask the question, what is LAN? Anyway, so logical unit number, first of all, uh, logical unit number. And second thing is that it is you know, in easy words, remote storage coming from SAN. Remote storage coming from SAN is one one, maybe one terabyte. It's the disk that is coming from SAN over the network, right? So, uh, logical number, and it's a remote storage coming from SAN. So, always remember that in production environments, in interviews for any companies, you will be asked about this concept of SAN. Is it important for virtualization? Well, it is so important that without that, you can't imagine virtualization. So that's why, well, it, you can have virtual machines just like we have uh, on a local disk, but then you don't have safety there. You don't have high availability there. You don't have disaster recovery uh, there. It's not a professional setup. There is uh, another alternate for that for smaller companies because I'm talking about SAN here. So there is another alternate, which is vSAN, uh, which is, of course, uh, virtual SAN 
what that does is suppose the company says hey we don't have uh, uh, $500,000, $100,000, $50,000 for that uh, sand that you are offering us. So do you have an alternate solution that is cheaper but does the same thing? So yes, there is a software based sand called virtual sand. Virtual sand, it uses local physical disks to create a highly available storage. To create a highly available, highly available storage. So vSAN is really going, getting famous here. <coughs> Some companies are earning millions now with only this concept, vSAN. So it's just using local physical disks and then it is uh, creating a big, uh, highly available storage on top of local physical disks. Then you don't need to buy uh, that SAN solution from ENC, from IBM. Uh, from HP uh, because those are expensive SaaS solutions in all banks, governments and big companies, hospitals, insurance companies uh, they will have SAN already there because it's very reliable but this is for cheaper, it is cheaper solution so I'm just gonna add that it is cheaper solution <coughs> okay so uh, VSAN is also one option now why all this discussion uh, because first of all, I wanted to make clear that uh, if we want to create a replica environment like a professional environment, we uh, don't have that right now because we are still using local physical disk. We haven't created a SAN yet and we haven't created a, a virtual disk of a virtual machine on top of a LAN because we don't have one, right? So uh, now we're going to talk about uh, another thing called migration. So first thing is the storage should be the recommended <coughs> professional setup is that you should have sand. That's the professional setup, right? And in every big company, you will have that professional setup. Second thing is that uh, suppose one hypervisor is not performing okay, so how soon can you move the machine to the second hypervisor without a downtime, right? So that's the second question here. So, if I just create those machines again, okay. So again, that's your machine one, which is just giving you DNS, uh, DHCP. Uh, machine two, that is give, going to give you SCVMM. <coughs> Excuse me. Machine three is your hypervisor. Machine four is your hypervisor. So. But uh, now the question is that if if a VM to which end users are connected are connected is not performing well, then uh, how and you find out and you find out that uh, the hypervisor memory and CPU are not uh, providing enough performance for any reason. Maybe you have enough, uh, 5 or 10 uh, virtual machines here. So that's why they're not providing enough uh, performance there. So how can you move and you realize that uh, the other, if a VM to which any of are connected is not performing well then and you find out uh, that the hypervisor uh, and CPU are not providing enough performance. So, how can you move a virtual machine from one hypervisor to another without a zero downtime? With, with a zero downtime, without any downtime, right? So, then how can we move uh, that VM, that VM to another hypervisor? To another hypervisor without any downtime or least amount of downtime. So the, now the scenario again is, it's, this is our scenario here. So we still have uh, here a physical disk here and a physical disk here in this hypervisor. Now this physical disk here <coughs> is hosting our virtual machine, right? So if I just put my virtual machine here now, this virtual machine is here 
And so when we create a virtual machine, it asks that where do you want to put the virtual disk? So we put the virtual disk here on the physical disk. Obviously, where else can we put? We have to put it on virtual disk. So now this hypervisor 3 is giving very bad performance. The CPU and memory are not uh, enough. Maybe you have a lot of virtual machines here, right? And those virtual machines are really uh, all consuming all the memory. And uh, because of that, uh, one virtual machine that uh, the users are connected to is not performing well. Uh, the users are saying that the files are frozen, the files are not opening at all, or it takes really long time to open. It is, the performance is unacceptable. So the boss says uh, that, hey, just move the machine right away. So uh, if you want to move this machine from this hypervisor to here, so there are several ways here. You can turn off the machine and tell the users bye bye and then move the machine from this hypervisor to this hypervisor right uh, so so that is called code migration right so uh, we can move the vm from one hypervisor to another um, while it is off so that's called Core migration, core migration, right? So uh, in this migration, of course, uh, uh, users are not connected at all. And then you do the migration. Then there's a hot migration there, and that is the migration where users are actually connected. Machine is powered on. So uh, we can uh, move a VM from one hypervisor to another while VM is powered on. That is called art migration. Right? So we're going to do both type of migrations here. Uh, the only other thing to understand here is that uh, the, the within migration there are also two types and I explained already that there's a sand based migration and then there is a local disk based migration so we're actually going for a local disk migration because we don't have a sand solution yet available the software sand solution that we can make available it's not still available for with us right so that these two types so we're gonna go for both core migration and hot migration but we need to understand one more thing here is that uh, there are and let me just uh, share this migration and then there is no shared migration so if we talk about that share this migration and no shared migration all the points are there as well I'm gonna put it in the slide as well uh, but uh, the main thing is do we understand what we are doing right so the no shared migration would be that if you have the hypervisors here uh, hypervisor uh, you know your machine has 0, 03 and 0, 04 right so if you have two hypervisors here now uh, you have of course uh, right now uh, the unprofessional environment where the local disk local physical disk has the virtual disk of your virtual machine so your virtual machine is here of course it has to put its disk somewhere so it is we have placed it on the local physical disk so this is a virtual disk here right so I could just go for V disk, virtual disk here, and that is V machine, virtual machine, right? And that is physical disk here. So what happens is now this is called no shared migration. So uh, what happens in a no shared migration? You don't have sand, right? So the disks, the LUNs are not connected to any of the hypervisors. This means your virtual disk is sitting on a local physical disk. That is unprofessional, but that's what we have. And that's what local companies would have, right? So uh, what would happen now is if you want to move the machine, it's not only that the machine will move from one hypervisor to the other. Normally it sits on the memory of one hypervisor uh, and then it moves its contents uh, from the memory of one hypervisor to the other hypervisor. So machine, not only the machine will move, but also its virtual disk will move as well. 
so that is called no shared migration uh, where you don't have a shared disk you don't have a remote disk you, won't, you don't have a lawn there coming from a SAN you just have two physical disks the source physical disk and the destination physical disk and virtual machine changes the hypervisor the virtual disk also changes the physical disk uh, and a hypervisor as well so that's what we're going to do now uh, we're going to just uh, make sure that uh, virtual machine moves and its virtual disk also moves right so in no shared migration uh, the points that uh, are uh, we're gonna make there okay so the points that we're gonna make here is that uh, it includes the uh, no shared migration and includes the disk being migrated along with the virtual machine configuration files uh, it is normally done during off times when employees are not working on the virtual machines remotely. It takes much longer time for the VMs to migrate from one hypervisor to another. Why would it take longer time for the this migration to happen? It will take long, you know, maybe all night. It will take all night to migrate a virtual machine. So why would it happen? Because the virtual disk may be, it is being used, suppose this virtual machine is being used, it's a file server. It is being used for five years. Uh, file server, suppose, this is a file server. And it is used for five years now, and uh, it has a lot of data inside. So maybe that virtual disk is uh, 80 GB, 100 GB, 200 GB. So it might take all night for the virtual disk to travel from one hypervisor to another hypervisor. It might take all night for that, right? So that's why, uh, because the disk also travels with the virtual machine, that's why it's going to be a long migration. So in this migration, the virtual disk also moves with the virtual machine. So that's why this type of migration takes uh, a lot of time and because of the size of because of the size of the virtual disk itself so this is called no shared migration then what is shared disk migration we just need to know some part of it uh, that how do we do that and let's do the labs and of course your favorite moment the screenshots uh, so uh, let's just uh, first of all this is no shared migration the virtual disk also moves and it takes a long time right so if we go ahead with the shared disk migration and that's your fourth uh, diagram now so you have those uh, hypervisors there hypervisor 3 and hypervisor 4 So here, now uh, with shared disk migration, what is shared disk migration? So it's, uh, as the name says, it has a shared disk, right? What does that mean? So this means this is a large company. You have purchased a SAN solution already. So you have a SAN solution here, rows and rows of uh, devices or tower. Uh, devices that have a lot of disks there uh, and so if you have purchased that SAN solution uh, so of course everything is easy then everything is fast then right so this SAN solution is here suppose and then what happens is you map lots of disks from over the network here maybe 200 disks here 200 so these disks are called LUNs they are shared storage, right? So connection to that hypervisor, connection to this hypervisor, right? In our case, suppose we have three LUNs here. Now, these disks are just uh, available over the network, right? So they are available over the network. So what happens is that uh, if you create a virtual machine now in a big environment, this is a big environment, right? So the virtual it will ask that where do you want to create the virtual disk of this virtual machine so you will say yes of course on the LAN so you have a LAN available and you create a virtual disk here of a virtual machine virtual disk and this is virtual machine so 
if you create a virtual machine, uh, virtual disk here, now again the same scenario. The performance is so bad. The users are end users are connected to this file server here, and the performance is very bad. The users are calling you, hey, uh, can you just make this performance better? I'm opening a file and it's not opening, uh, or it's opening after some time. This is unacceptable. We're uh, this is a peak hour of working, and we can't just wait like this. So you this determine that okay yes uh, I can see that uh, the uh, hypervisor 3 has a lot of virtual machines here and they're all looking for uh, uh, you know they're all using this uh, sharing the same uh, RAM and CPU for that hypervisor physical hypervisor so why don't I just transfer this one where the users are connected and they're complaining this time in shared disk when you migrate only virtual machine moves but the disk does not travel in uh, share disk migration. So if the virtual machine moves here, it still has a connection to its virtual disk from hypervisor 4 as well. Right? So that's why it will take milliseconds for the virtual machine to migrate from hypervisor 3 to hypervisor 4. And uh, this means that all of a sudden users will see, whoa, that's a very good performance now. What, what did you do on the other side? So you can just say magic. But the, what you did was that you had sent your virtual disk never travels here and it is sitting on a remote storage the storage that is already coming from the network right so your virtual disk is here your virtual machine has a communication to that virtual disk as soon as it moves from hypervisor 3 to hypervisor 4 that same LUN that is attached here to hypervisor 3 that same LUN is attached to hypervisor 4 as well or this is a remote disk that is attached to hypervisor 3 is the same disk remote disk that is attached to hypervisor 4 so as soon as virtual machine reaches here, it still get keeps its connection to this virtual disk. So virtual disk may be 200 GB, uh, you know, space there. It may have a big uh, data there, but it doesn't have to travel. So that's the one liner there uh, that uh, in this migration, the virtual disk does not move only virtual machine moves so it takes so the migration so the migration is done uh, in seconds or milliseconds even so the difference between SAN share disks and uh, uh, the local disk is that with local disk you have a bad performance or it takes long time with SAN based disks you have very good performance and it doesn't take it does take uh, seconds to move over to the machine from one hypervisor to another or even a millisecond so uh, it just is done within that so as soon as the virtual machine moves to uh, another hypervisor uh, maybe that hypervisor has a lot of RAM and CPU that's why you moved it there once it moves it there so all the users who are connected to the virtual machine now will see a very very good performance there because the machine is on a hypervisor that may have less other virtual machines so a lot of RAM and CPU is available right so that's the main purpose of that uh, uh, shared disk migration uh, and then no shared no shared migration here and uh, also if you go to the third diagram here uh, the types of migrations there cold migration and hot migration and then there is the SAN and then there is virtual SAN that uh, storage area network here and virtual SAN there right Okay, so since we are very much enjoying this uh, discussion and, uh, okay, so, oh, now I got your attention, woo, okay, so in other colleges, uh, college where it's a vocational college, uh, those guys have to implement it maybe next week or they are actually being paid there to do this all, so they are like looking at me, staring at me like, uh, I'm, sometimes I'm scared, whoa, hello, how much is it, how, how many fingers are these, so they're like, no sir, I'm concentrating. I'm trying to understand that. What to say? So here it's like, ah, teach. Come on, give me screenshots and <laughs> bye bye. I need some marks. Good. So anyway, but uh, if those who are understanding, congratulations. Those who are like, uh, okay. So <laughs> it's your choice, right? Uh, but uh, well, at least you know 
I tried to explain. So there are those who are understanding as well, and uh, that's really good uh, because you need to get a better job, right? So get a better job sooner. And if you want to do certifications, I have all the material. Just email me, and I will send you that material. And whenever you have time, you can go for those professional certifications. Without those, you won't be able to get a better job sooner, right? So all the material is there, but the material covers some of that as well. Uh, I can go for all theory three, blah 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 blah, and then give you all lots of marks, and you go ahead and woohoo! I got so I got a plus in all those. Can I get a job or, uh, because of this knowledge? Uh, no. Okay. So where's the vocational college where they really go for labs after and hands-on labs and really in depth? I'm gonna pay attention there a lot. So well, maybe you then will hop on to the other college. After you learn the hard way, oh, okay, I needed some more knowledge which I should pay attention to. Okay, so anyway, I'm just giving you reality. I love to talk reality, right? So reality in the market is uh, the more knowledgeable you're in this industry, IT, uh, the better, sooner you will get a job, right? If you're less knowledgeable, uh, you know, okay, you, wanna, you might want to learn the hard way then that uh, what you should have done anyway uh, I can only just talk about it so let's go ahead and uh, let's do that lab that gives you marks Woohoo! oh I think I'm being too realistic now so <clears throat> but uh, sticking to reality is always a very very good idea so uh, here uh, what we need to do is what is our plan the plan is that we need to do uh, some uh, migration here uh, we need to move the machine from hypervisor 3 to hypervisor 4 while that machine's disk will also move from hypervisor 3 to hypervisor 4. So virtual machine and its disk will both move from 3 to 4. Now we're going to do that. The first lab is, uh, of course, uh, the main steps here are that uh, main step number one, uh, configure both hypervisors for migration right so we're going to configure the prereqs prerequisites then second thing is migrate okay do cold migration uh, do cold migration from 3 to 4 high brother 3 to high brother 4 then third major step is do hot migration from 4 to 3 for the same machine for from 4 to 3 for the same VM. You migrated core migration, which is powered off. Hot migration is it is powered on now, right? So, uh, configuring all that and making the machine move from here to there, and it should arrive intact, right? So, it should not be in bits and pieces when it arrives at 4 uh, because all user data is there, right? You lose user data, uh, your, your job is in trouble, right? So, um, what we need to go for is let's just uh, start doing the uh, prerequisites there finally and uh, here so no shared yeah we talked about that shared we talked about that too so live migration no shared prerequisites so added domain uh, added domain admin to hyper v administrator security group let's just go for those prereqs there uh, now prerequisite number one is that uh, they should have the same processors right so we can just check mark or we can just uh, imagine that yes that is done that is not done etc etc so uh, all hypervisors hypervisors uh, must have the same processor type. So if they are all Intel, it's going to migrate. Machines will migrate. If they are all AMD, machines will migrate. If half are Intel, half are AMD, machines will not migrate. So the processor types must be same or exactly the same generation at least, right? So in our case, I think the processors are same generation. And... Uh, that's good, man. Uh, so the thing is that uh, you guys are really quiet. I really appreciate that. The other class, tomorrow's class, and uh, it's the section that was with me for last four months before. So the last two benches, last two rows, they're like, whoa, I shot. I just, uh, you know, they're just playing that game, you know. I don't know what that game is, first-person shooter. 
and they are all joined to the game and they go, oh, 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 I shot you, okay, head kill. I'm like, really? So, last time I had to tell them, hey, class discipline, you want to do that, do it quietly, okay. So I understand, the, you know, you just here for what? Anyway, so then they were really, really quiet. I was too quiet. Okay, so anyway, uh, here, uh, so what I'm saying is that maybe some activity is going on at the end of the row here, and uh, people are very excited. Uh, they yes. Yeah. So, so it's like you guys are like, uh, you know, oh, okay, same game or different games. Anyway, so, uh, but it, it, okay, let's just go ahead. Uh, first of all, same processor type here. Second thing is, uh, they're all joined to the domain as well. Now, third thing is that we need to add it. There's a security group called Hyper-V Administrators, right? So let's add our domain admin to this security group. This security group right now is empty. Now this is inside the Active Directory and so let's go to server one, open Active Directory users and computers, and then look for where is that security group called Hyper-V Administrators and add our domain admin to that group. And I need to count the screenshots. As the rule goes, not a screenshot more, not a screenshot less. So I'll just count with you on the screenshots there. So okay. Oh man, 25 screenshots. Should be 60, 70, 80 screenshots. Or 100, yeah. Let's do 10. You mean 110, right? Just 10. Okay. Okay, guys, here. Uh, so let's just go to server one. Am I recording that all? Yeah. Okay. So once we are on server one here and open Active Directory users and computers. So server manager, in server 1, if you're there, click the tools and go to this, Active Directory, Users and Computers. Once you're inside, go to virtual domain dot local here and then the users container. Inside, you should be seeing, if it's not there, then we're going to have to go to built-in, but uh, is it there in H? Oops, it's not there, actually. So, it has to be then in the built-in containers. So, if you go to built-in containers, yes, there is H. And, so, this is the security group to which your domain admin should be a member or whichever account you logged in from. It, it should be added to Hyper-V administrators, although it has all the privileges to do anything, it's just good to do that. So what is our account uh, name with which we are logged in? It is your first name admin, right? So let's just go to Hyper-V administrator where we already are, double click that, and go to members, go to members, and then click add. So anyone not receiving the videos or not able to access the videos, let me know in the break as well. Uh, if you need to go there, uh, I think three or four students are not there. All others are here. So that's good. Click, click add here. And your first name, admin. Right? And take your first screenshot here. Yep. Hypervisor? Is it the yeah, it is in the built-in container. Built-in container. And then double click. So I'm inside this Hyper-V administrators. If you're there, I went to members. Members and then add. Are you all there? And if you're on this screen of members and add, and you have just added, so you can just click the check name or before the check name, just take a first screenshot here. So I'll just type one here. This means one screenshot. Are we all here? Well, uh, if without check name you have taken a screenshot, that is also okay. And with check name is also okay. Doesn't matter. Anyone. 
so if we have uh, done that all done let's go ahead press ok so we've added this uh, domain admin to the hyper v administrators uh, properties now what that does is that it just gives added uh, privileges to this uh, account to uh, initiate live migrations or cold migrations there right so uh, if that is done click apply ok apply ok so that's one thing and uh, then on the domain here we can just uh, uh, if uh, just a few hundred times refresh okay so it's refreshed here and uh, that's the one uh, first thing uh, then we go for rest of the uh, prereqs there prerequisites uh, and there is that constraint delegation now we need to tell active directory that which two machines have hyper-v and uh, these two machines are supposed to be uh, allowed to do live migration so that whole step is called constraint delegation so uh, we're just going to go there i'm going to explain that as well so constraint delegation we must configure the two hypervisors inside aduc which is active directory the users and computers to be able to perform live migration with Active Directory permission. So the two hypervisors are requesting Active Directory. Can, a Active Directory can we try? Uh, can we do live migration or not? So uh, this is the process of constraint delegation. So we're gonna do that now, and that's also done in Active Directory, right? So let's do the constraint delegation, which is another prereq. Uh, and uh, one more thing here is that. Uh, the constraint delegation has these two protocols uh, to be configured so uh, obviously first of all we have to go and check this area and then uh, we can go back to the actual steps of constraint delegation so uh, what is CRAS SP and Kerberos and what am I talking about here now so uh, let's go back to our hypervisor 3 which is machine 3 So I'm in machine 3 now and uh, let's open Hyper-V, so tools, Hyper-V manager, tools, Hyper-V manager in your first name 03. Once you're inside your first name 03 here and you've opened the Hyper-V manager here, so click that your first name 03 again inside the Hyper-V manager and then right click on it let's go to hyper v settings i hope everyone sees that okay so once we go inside hyper v settings here uh, so we can just go down to this uh, live migration section here now once we're inside like, the live migration section so we can do several settings here and uh, uh, one of the settings here is actually uh, the related to constraint delegation. So first of all, instead of configuring this area, uh, because we just talked about constraint delegation, so let's, do you see the plus sign here on the left side? Click that plus sign, and then you see advanced features. So if you click the advanced features here, uh, well, there's that use credential security support provider, credit SSP, and use Kerberos. So we're not able to select it, it's grayed out. So what we need to do is of course, uh, let's go back to the above step and then we're gonna come back here anyway. So live migration again, this one, live migration, right? And click, check mark this, enable incoming and outgoing live migrations. So we're gonna enable the migrations of virtual machines from one hypervisor to another. So in case they have bad performance on one hypervisor, they can be moved to another hypervisor so they can get much better performance in terms of CPU and RAM. So if you just click the enable incoming and outgoing live migrations, there is simultaneous live migration option here. And it says that you can do right now, uh, simultaneously two virtual machines can be migrated from one hypervisor to another, right? And then uh, there is another option here, incoming live migration. So use any available network for live migration. Right now, our network is 192.168, 200 dot something, right? 200 dot X. So that's our network. But we can just go for the second option here as well and actually give our subnet here, network we are using, 
we don't really have to do that we can just stick to the above one but let's just do that just to know that what are the formats in which we can give our network ID or machine ID so use these IP addresses for live migration and click add and there we can just give our network that we're using right now which is 192.168.200.0 slash 24 right so uh, we have given our network ID here so if the hypervisors are inside this ID as long as they are there uh, you can do live migration if they are uh, other than this subnet maybe to one into one sixty two one dot you know zero slash twenty four so if it is not added here they won't be able to migrate the virtual machines won't be able to migrate to that subnet if it is not added here if after we have added a specific subnet so you have to add all the subnets that will be taking part in the migration so press OK here now it should look like this so that's your second screenshot take a screenshot here <clears throat> so once this is done and you've taken a screenshot here let's go back to that advanced features here this one so once we click the advanced features now yep sorry well it's still the same section you can apply now or even later it's okay same thing so click advanced features as well and you can see here credits sp and kerberos the only thing to understand between the two is that credits sp is used when you are sitting in front of a hypervisor and logged in directly to a hypervisor and then initiate a live migration so credits sp is used when you're sitting in front of the uh, you know hypervisor machine in a data center and you're logging in locally there like local still domain account but you are in front of it you're logging in with the machine directly so that's what we are doing we are in front of our machines and we are logging in so the crisis p would be the best suitable uh, you know uh, uh, way of uh, connecting to the hypervisor and initiating live migration but in companies normally you are given when you join a company uh, after a tough interview uh, then you are given either a laptop or a desktop to remotely connect to suppose you are uh, responsible for uh, 200 hypervisors there each hypervisor has 50 or 100 machines there uh, so that's a lot of machines thousands of virtual machines that you're responsible for so you will remotely connect to any hypervisor you won't be sitting in front of those hypervisors in a data center data center is normally very cold right so you'll be frozen well it's not that cool but still the, the thing is that you will be remotely connecting to them so the production environment and the companies they use Kerberos Kerberos is that you remotely connect with uh, your active directory credentials to a hypervisor and then initiate live migration so again crisis P you are in front of it hypervisor and you log in directly inside hypervisor with active directory account and Kerberos says you remotely connect with the remote desktop or with PowerShell and then initiate a live migration if you want to do use Kerberos which means you will be remotely connecting which is normally used professionally in all companies so you have to if you selected that you have to do the extra steps of constraint delegation as well which we were about to do back there in the active directory but I wanted to show you first that uh, this is a way that you have to select first then you can do constraint delegation or you can even do consideration before then you have to come here then you can't use credit SP then you have to click the curb rules because normally you will be doing that in the companies as well when you're remotely connecting and initiating live migration in, instead of directly connecting so we're going to click use curb rules then we have to go back to Active Directory and uh, configure the configure uh, you know uh, constraint delegation option there. So use Kerberos is there. Second thing is there's a performance options here as well. TCP/IP compression based and SMB based. SMB is the server message block, server message block, and that is a protocol with which Windows share files with each other, right? Windows machines share files with each other with SMB. Uh, so compression is 
that uh, when the virtual machine is traveling it's going to be compressed all the data will be compressed and then you're going to migrate that virtual machine uh, so this means that it's going to be uh, you know migrating faster because the data is compressed it does take uh, some uh, toll on the cpu and memory because it's going to compress first and then it's going to decompress on the other side when it reaches the other hypervisor then there's tcp ip which is you know going to be slower because it doesn't compress it just uh, sends the data as is from one hypervisor to another when you're doing live migration. So that's your third screenshot. So take a screenshot here where use Kerberos is selected. Take a screenshot here where use Kerberos is selected. So once you're done with that, uh, that's your third screenshot and now click apply and okay so I'm sure that you would have taken a screenshot where your name is clear there yep Good. you're stuck in oh really well okay there's a tissue Okay. It's just a right? Yeah, that's good. 
Pokemon Go actually. That one? This is still the old one, right? Or the Go, which is a... You actually go. Okay, so let's go. Uh, I was recording all this. So let's go ahead. And uh, what we were doing here was we're going to do exactly the same thing on Hypervisor 4 as well. So uh, let's press OK. Hey, didn't we have a machine here? But. No. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, all right, or maybe I use these for migration already with another, with the other class. So, let's go for our Hyper-V manager here in Hypervisor 4 and uh, right click on 4, seriously, we never created any virtual machine here? Okay, there's something wrong with binds, or I'll just create some machine. Yeah. Oh, I don't have any virtual machine. That's not fair. Mm hmm. Okay. Mm hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, let's go to Hypervisor 4 here and then go to the same settings here for Hypervisor 4, Hyper V, and Hyper V settings here. And once you're inside, that's the same thing that we just did in Hypervisor 3. So we're going to go to Hypervisor 4 here, go to Live Migrations, and enable incoming and outgoing Live Migration. Second thing is, use these IP address addresses for Live Migration, because we want to, we don't really have to give this specific subnet, but we're just giving it, you know, just to know that, how to give it. So otherwise, we don't need that in production environment as well, or both ways are okay, with or without it. So what I do, I want to say, because we mentioned a subnet there in 3, so we have to be consistent in our configurations. So slash 24 here, 192.168.200.0 slash 24, and press OK. That's the same thing we did before. Now, obviously, screenshot number 4, because this section and the other one uh, which comes out. So take a screenshot, first of all, here will be your fourth screenshot. So... First screenshot here and showing clearly that it is the fourth and then we click the plus sign here and we know what to do there now advanced features and use Kerberos that's the only thing we changed here obviously we need a screenshot for this one as well make sure your name is showing there so take a screenshot here take a screenshot and once you've taken a screenshot that would be your fifth screenshot here so apply OK. So if that is done, mm -hmm. oh, Tim Hortons already closed. Seven o'clock. Too late. The building one. Okay. So. Uh, if you've uh, done the configuration for both uh, with Kerberos as a protocol selected there because we're going to remotely connect or in the production environment at least we will be using that so we need to know the whole procedure because of that so if you've done in on both hypervisor let's go back to our active directory users and computers on server one and on server one what we need to do is uh, we need to configure constrained delegation now which we were talking about before uh, so if I just go back to the one note here so constraint delegation would be this so we must configure the two hypervisors inside ADUC to be able to perform live migration with active directory permission that's what we're about to do so that's why we are doing that so active directory could allow us to remotely connect to the hypervisors and initiate a live migration so that's going to be securely done with the help of active directory so let's go for those steps here now you have to be careful here a bit uh, so let's just go ahead uh, first of all we go for computers container here and there are those uh, 0 03 hypervisor and 0 04 hypervisors. We know that Hi Hyper V is installed only on 3 and 4. So let's go for 3 here and right click. And we need to go to properties of hypervisor 3. 
make sure all these steps are cre uh, correct because ultimately you have to do a live migration. Uh, first we're going to do it together, then I'm going to give you a task and you're going to do migrate uh, back as well. So let's click properties. The question? Whoa. Do we all see that? Three and four? No, you may not have added it. You were saying that when you click file and open. Oh, but here, yeah. This means it's not joined to the domain if it's not here. Or if you check the domain controllers, there should be one here, right? So if it is, so maybe you have to disjoin and join again. Yeah. Oh, again. So guys, uh, well, if you can, you should have external drive. 250 GB maybe. That's I think 25 or 45 dollars here, but uh, that external drive will really save you a lot of time and marks. Like if you're way behind because of the machines are not performing. So do copy it in an external drive here. Um, okay. So three and four here, right? So if you see that, right click on three and go for properties. And once you're in properties, you can go for delegation. So I'll just put it to the right side so we could see this screen as well. And then the delegation tab here, this one, right? Once we are there, then click the trust this computer for delegation to specified services only. The services that we're about to select now, they take part in the live migration process. So we are telling Active Directory, hey Active Directory, we are asking your permission to enable these services so we could do live migration on hypervisor 3 and the same steps we're going to do on hypervisor 4 as well so how do we add those services among lots of lots of services there uh, so uh, if it is selected already click add once you click add here then there is use users or computers that's the only button here right so click that users or computers so where do you want to add those services so it is the your first name 03 hypervisor where we want to add the services it's not a user it's a computer so check name here just to make sure it got the hypervisor name machine name here if you all got it press ok we all got it right Yeah, your hypervisor, this is what we right clicked here. So that's the computer name. So press OK here. Now you see a lot of services, long lists of services here. Right? So if we can drag this column a little to the right side, now the first service on this computer here is what we need is CIFS. But there's one other service we need. So yeah, you have to keep it selected and keep the control key pressed. So I'm going to keep on pressing the control key now on the keyboard and keep going down like this slowly or fastly. And then if I drag it, you see that second Microsoft Virtual System Migration Service. Select that too. That's the two services we needed, but now you can just release the key, control key there. But I'm just gonna quick, so, uh, carefully go scroll up as well. Yeah, it is still selected. If I scroll down as well, yes, that is also still selected, right? So press OK. So this is what you see. These are the two services on this particular machine you're selected. So drag it a little further like this. And take a screenshot so this screenshot only required sixth screenshot obviously we're gonna do exactly the same thing on the hypervisor 4 as well so this will this process will allow hypervisors to let us remotely connect to them and then initiate a live migration right so if you see those two services there in three let's exactly on this page we're gonna take the 
uh, screenshot of for hyperlinker four as well. Exactly with these two services added there as well, right? So if that is added and you've taken a screenshot already now, click apply and okay. Now I'm going to go and do exactly the same steps on hypervisor 4. Suppose there were 50 hypervisors. So that would have been a long list of tasks. And well, there are partial commandlets for those. Any problem? Okay, so here, if you go for hypervisor 4 here and click properties, then we go for delegation. And then we go for trust this computer for delegation to specified services only. If you're all here, then we click the add button here. We click again users or computers. And this time it's the hypervisor 4, your first name 04, the machine, and check name. Always, always, always check name. And press OK. So it will list the services. What do you want to run? for which services you need permission from Active Directory. So CIFS is the first one and we know the drill now. Keep pressing the control key on the keyboard and keep going down, 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 down. Oops. And well, we just expand that and just... So then simply check if both are still selected. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. So press OK here. And first expand the column, then take a screenshot. Expand the column. Now take a screenshot here. It will be your seventh. Okay. Apply OK here. If you've taken a screenshot already, now we have configured the constraint delegation, which means uh, we're allowed to remotely connect to those hypervisors and initiate a live migration. So let's click the virtual domain dot local domain name here and refresh a couple of just a few hundred times. Yep. Hmm. Oh, what happened? Well, I the, yeah, it's 
Alright guys, so let's go ahead. Okay, so we're back here and this is all being recorded. And I'll just check the space as well. 19 GB, 76 GB, okay, not bad. Oh, 19 GB, serious? Okay. Here, once we have done the constraint delegation, let's, be, uh, let's go for the next prerequisite here. So, if we check our list here, uh, we have uh, confirmed that we have added the administrator to the Hyper-V administrators, the security group in Active Directory, then we did the constraint delegation. We have also configured uh, the two hypervisors for the live migration settings there, and if we put the subnet uh, there as well. Now, the next prereq is same name and number of virtual switches. So, we have created three virtual switches, or actually four total are there in Hypervisor 3, and we have just one virtual switch in Hypervisor 4. So, we have to have same number of virtual switches and same named virtual switch. So, uh, normally when you install Hyper-V, you have one external virtual switch created by default. So, we just need one external virtual switch in hypervisor 3 and one external virtual switch in hypervisor 4 the rest we're gonna just get rid of or delete them right so uh, let's go ahead and confirm that so if you go to the hypervisor 3 here on hypervisor 3 if you're there go to the hypervisor manager and right click like this because we have created number of switches in virtual switch manager let's go there and get rid of them now so virtual switch manager on Hypervisor 3 and seriously okay you know what I must have when I was having a problem last time in the class I must have gone for a snapshot one so that just <clears throat> remove everything and uh, so uh, do you see four switches there or do you see so in Hypervisor 3 ignore mine because I had to I was having problems so I had to go back so do we see just one switch or total four switches okay how do we remove them so see this if select on uh, and what is the name of the switches there external, external, oh your first name okay so yeah okay all right external we, so I'm just doing that. You don't have to really follow that because you already have it. I didn't have it, so I'll have it now. So um, I'm just gonna quickly apply. Okay. So I have just one. We need to reach this exact configuration where we have just one external virtual switch. So all other switches we need to get rid of, uh, except for the zero one external virtual switch. So how do we get rid of the switch? If you click on the internal switch first whichever is your internal switch first click that so once you click the internals virtual switch just you know go ahead and read that so on the right side do you see if you scroll down a bit here exactly do you see remove here so once you click go ahead and click the remove for the internal switch like this as soon as you click remove it has this strike outline here right so you don't have to click apply now then go to the private switch check the private switch click the remove there as well until it strikes out like this did we all do that and then there is a your first name external virtual switch 02 make sure you're selecting your first name external virtual switch 02 when you select that same thing Yeah, zero two. We are removing private switch. We are removing internal switch. We are removing. Uh, so let me just uh, put those names there because uh, uh, if it is, we haven't added switch two. We haven't. Okay. 
So I should have had the same environment. It's just that uh, I was having a lot of. It was because of that uh, very expensive antivirus. So I maybe have mentioned that before. Very expensive is Avast, right? It's free. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but <clears throat> because I saw Josh Brown using Avast, so I used that too. <laughs> so oh yes, here. So which switch? Oh, it rhymes. Okay, which switch need to be removed? Uh, so, at your first name, internal, we switch, uh, your first name, private, we switch, and your first name, uh, external, we switch, but 02, make sure it is ending with 02, if it's not there, it's already okay, if it is there, that is ending with 02, uh, then what I showed you already click remove if it should be strike through right now, right? So if it is all strike through Then you have to uh, okay. Uh, whoa, 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 wait, 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 okay Did we all click uh, are the three strike throughs are showing right now? Yeah. Oh, thank God. Okay. Take a screenshot That's your eighth screenshot so the three strike throughs are showing and you took a screenshot, right? Now click apply and they should all be gone. When they're gone and you only see the one, your first name external vswitch zero one, then take another screenshot. So first you have removed these three. Before that you have taken a screenshot when they were strike out. Now it's empty with just one external switch showing there. Take a screenshot there as well. Changes must make this oh yeah, that's the process of removal, which is okay. So press yes. So click apply after remove. If it says pending changes, press yes to that too. It's still a process of removal, and hopefully it's done. If it is done and it is empty and it is only showing uh, well what I have. So if it is only showing this, well, I'm just gonna cancel out and uh, just come back here because I just wanted to show you what to do. I really need that. So uh, now if you see this screen here, exactly like this, so select on only this switch and take your next screenshot, which would be your ninth screenshot, yeah. Okay. So what happens is sometimes that when you're doing this step, it just not does not go to. Uh, it, let's say internal error. Internal error. So scan that. So do you have virtual machine connected to that? Can be needed because it's being used by running virtual machines or assigned to try. Well, what's called? So press. So guys, if your machines are running, power them off, and then come back into that. Oh yeah. Oh, no, it's true. Yeah. Too late. I just power off the virtual machine. Oh yeah, I understand. This is the virtual machine. Right? Virtual machine inside the network. So yeah, if it's running, turn off. And then try again. Yeah. Cool. So if everyone's done with that and you've taken the ninth screenshot here, I hope it's going fine for you. Okay, so once that is done, so this is our external switch here. Let's press OK. Done, right? So we needed two screenshots, one screenshot with strike out three switches. Once they're all gone and you have just one switch, take another screenshot. If that is done, let's go ahead. So uh, we're just cleaning our environment for live migration right now. Yeah. So when the three strikeouts are gone, then it is kind of empty with just one virtual switch showing there. Oh, yeah. 
So one screenshot for that too. So right here, let's go for the second hypervisor. Let's just check what can we make similar exactly to the first hypervisor. So if we go to the second hypervisor here, and right click here, which is uh, in the virtual switch manager, we just have one virtual switch there, right? And it exactly looks like this for everyone, I guess, right? Exactly like this. So all we need to do is just simply change the name to the one we have in uh, Hypervisor 3. So it will be your first name, external v switch 01. So it should be the exact same name. So that's on Hypervisor 4. It's on machine 4. It's on machine 4, Hypervisor 4, and so if you've done that and click apply, yep, yeah, if you've done that, take a screenshot here as well. That would be your 10th screenshot. So on Hypervisor 4, that's the only switch there. We're just renaming it. That's the only switch there. We're just renaming it. So once you have renamed, uh, whether you click apply or not, just take a screenshot first of this new name of this virtual switch, external virtual switch of Hypervisor 4 and apply OK. So apply, it's OK, right? So it's just done. Uh, if you've taken a screenshot already of this now with a new name, then press OK as well. We're going away, right? You understand what we're doing? Right? So if that is done, let's go ahead. Done, right? Okay, so now uh, the prerequisite where the virtual switches are supposed to be the same number, same number and same name actually. So that is also done. For the live migration, many things have to be carefully gone through. So uh, I'm just going to go back to the prereqs here. Now there is that prerequisite of uh, concern delegation done same name and uh, number of virtual switches that is also done now right so configured lm on both hypervisors which is live migration we already did that right so configure lm because uh, remember where you put the kerberos setting there that was the live migration on both hypervisor so we go down to that's it let's start doing our migration of a virtual machine Okay, so hmm, you have to install SQL Server as well. So, later. Now, I don't have a virtual machine, but you have two virtual machines, I guess? Two virtual machines you have? Or one? Uh, one. one on four. Oh, one on four only, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's go to four then. Oh, I'm on four actually. So, well, I had to, as you uh, know that, I had a problem and I had to go to snapshot one just to check that if that's the solution. It was that very, uh, you know, excellent hyper uh, antivirus, not hypervisor. So anyway, I'm just going to quickly create a virtual machine which you can ignore right now. So I'm just going to go for that virtual machine, same settings. You already have that virtual machine. Uh, what's the name for that? Uh, your first name, VM01, right? Exactly. Okay. So next and then generation two was this. You don't have to do that, guys. You don't have to do that. And uh, I think it was 1024. So I'm just creating a empty virtual machine. Yours is having an operating system with it, right? So live migration works both ways. So I'm just going to go for external virtual switch here. Next. Yes, VHDX is okay. So see this, we're just con uh, creating the virtual disk on top of a C drive, local physical disk. Next, and I'm not putting any operating system now. We don't have time for that. But uh, uh, the thing is that what we're, I'm going to do, you with a virtual machine having an operating system inside, will be able to do the same as I'm doing. So guys, uh, once we are done with the hypervisor prerequisites, they're live migration prerequisites actually. So. Uh, we have a virtual machine here that is off. Is it off for everyone? 
on Hypervisor 4. So the core migration is that the machine is off and you migrate it from one hypervisor to another. Then there is powered on hot migration or live migration, right? Where the machine is powered on. So if it is off, keep it off. In fact, make sure that the machine is off there. And uh, so take a screenshot here, screenshot 11. So you see the machine, it is off and it is in hypervisor 4. Take a screenshot, done. And that's your screenshot 11. <coughs> okay, once that is done, once the screenshot is taken, right click here, and there is a button called move. So right click the off virtual machine and click move. So once we click move, you see this wizard. So right click the machine and move. It, okay, so here, see this, off and then right click and move okay so once we're done with that before you begin the, the visit starts it's just click go ahead click next it's okay now this is the area choose move type you want to move the virtual machine or just the virtual machines storage so that just means that uh, the virtual machine storage uh, is the or all the files of the virtual machine and uh, virtual machine it's of course itself so if i just go over the diagram here just to explain that uh, for this diagram we have a virtual machine here and its virtual disk is on top of a physical disk here so it's just saying that you want to move this virtual machine only but keep its virtual disk on the same hypervisor or you want to move just the virtual disk from here to here on the other hypervisor but keep the virtual machine here so it will be over the network this virtual machine has to have a connection with that virtual disk so we're just saying that no 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 just move our virtual machine right so later we're going to define that yes move the disk with it but right now we're defining that move the virtual machine it says that optionally it's storage to another computer so it says that oh you want to move virtual machine and its storage but we're going to define later yes the whole thing virtual machine plus its storage move it so if you keep it the option here uh, virtual machine so take a screenshot here your 12th So once you have taken that uh, screenshot here for the move the virtual machine and of course your name must be showing there in every screenshot so click next now it says that which computer which hypervisor is your destination computer so click browse obviously you're on four so three is your uh, destination hypervisor so click the browse button here and just type your hypervisor three yeah Oh, so it's not enabled then. Let me check. So, once that is done, press OK. It should look like this now.
up, sir. You know what I was thinking of what she said. Oh, I see it. Oh, I see it. 
since we are all here no. so oh the whole break call recorded as well okay that's not well okay whoever is looking at the video just fast forward on YouTube a lot so uh, what we are putting here is the live migration. We're doing the live migration for, well, it's a cold migration right now. So the machine is off right now. It's going to be migrated from hypervisor 4 to 3. And we're putting the destination hypervisor here. Have we all put it? So this is just asking that, oh, you want to migrate from a machine, a virtual machine from hypervisor 4 to hypervisor 3. So uh, give me the destination. So yes, we know that we are on 4. We are giving the destination as hypervisor 3. So its name has to be there. So are we all here? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're... Uh, Moving the virtual machine that is living inside Hyper V here, okay. this virtual machine, okay. it is in four. We need to move it to three, so it will not be a copy. It will actually move the files from here to there. We that was another way import export, and this is another way to move the machine from one hypervisor to another. This is called migration. That is called import export. As we did that, so we're all good. Cool. So. Okay, guys, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, we have given the. Okay, <laughs> we're good, right? We can go ahead. Okay, so and uh, yeah, we're about to be. Yeah, this. this, 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 this. Okay, so uh, your destination, right? And click next. So, guys, here, move the virtual machine's data to a single location. So that's the end of our lab now, and we are going home. Oh, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, ready for home? Come on. You hurt my feelings now. Okay. <laughs> so, move the virtual machines. 
Yeah, other class, half of the class is normally doing from home uh, all the labs, half of the class in the other section. But I don't know uh, how they're managing it because they have to come here, it's not easy. So get it over with and, you know, while you're in the class. So move the virtual machines there to a single location. Now it is asking that, okay, when the virtual machine, which virtual machine you're talking about, this, okay, I'll just, this virtual machine moves from Hyperledger 4 to Hyperledger 3, where exactly do you want these machines virtual files to be uh, landed on which area of virtual uh, hypervisor 3 should the this virtual machine have its file uh, put on so what uh, we're going to just create that folder we haven't created the, any folder inside hypervisor 3 we're about to create it saying that you want a single location so move the virtual machines data to a single location, move virtual machines data by selecting where to move the items. Uh, this means that you can have multiple folders for one folder for VHDX, for virtual disk, one folder for snapshot, one folder for virtual memory, or move only the virtual machine. No, we want to move the storage plus virtual machine uh, there. So we're going to stick to the first option here, that to a single location. When we select single location, we have to go to hypervisor 3 here. And create a new folder right so uh, move the virtual machines data to a single location and click next so now it's asking okay you want to move to virtual machine 3 uh, or hypervisor 3 here I understand that but do you have a folder there that you want to specify here so we haven't created a folder yet in hypervisor 3 where this virtual machine will move to. So while on Hypervisor 4, you can keep it like that. On Hypervisor 4, you can keep this screen as is and go temporarily for a short time here. Go to Hypervisor 3. Let's go to Hypervisor 3 here and go to the yellow folder of Hypervisor 3, File Explorer, right? I am on Hypervisor 3 now. And then we can go to this PC and C drive of hypervisor 3. Inside the C drive, let's just create a new folder where this machine is about to come when it is migrated. So just create a new folder, right click a new folder here and just call it your first name exported VM or actually, sorry, sorry, sorry your first name make dash VM, migrated VM, right? So your first name make dash VM. So we're creating this folder here. So the virtual machine coming from hypervisor 4 uh, to hypervisor 3 should put all its file here in this particular folder because we want to prove that where exactly this machine landed when it uh, reached hypervisor 3. So we all get it, right? So, cool. Okay, so let's go to go back to hypervisor 4 after creating a folder in hypervisor 3. So let's go back to the source. Now here it is still asking, okay, which folder you want to go to inside Hypervisor 3. So uh, although we are sitting in 4, when we click browse here, we are going to be actually uh, seeing the folder structure of 3. So click the browse button here inside Hypervisor 4 and see this, the path. It is actually remotely connected to the C drive for us to show which exact folder you want to select. Uh, so the virtual machine could land there. So C drive here, and do you see your folder? This one. So it's already your Hyperweather 3, and this is the folder, double click that. Well, and go down there and select, actually, select folder, select folder. So click that select folder, now it should look like this, right? So this is your destination hypervisor where the virtual machine will be there, uh, its files will be there when it makes that migration so take a screenshot here which would be your 13th screenshot 13th screenshot <clears throat> so let's go for this and then click next if you've taken a screenshot so this is a summary here which is good and that would be your 14th screenshot ouch this is a summary which would be your 14th screenshot take a screenshot here 
take a screenshot here once you've taken a screenshot now if your firewalls are already off i hope they are off in fact uh, normally we don't assume in the field of it we never assume so before i click finish i just want to double check the firewalls on machine hypervisor 4 if i go back to the local server the server manager here oops actually it is on for me it is on so if it says off still don't trust it just click on top of it and and see that it is showing red right so i'm just gonna in my case it is on so i should not start while the firewall is still on and it should be all three red just see the three red and then only believe that the firewalls are off just by seeing there as off is you know so here if i go to three it is also on for me but if i see it off as well still i will just go inside and check the red signs there yeah so in three and four both but we don't need screenshot for the firewalls off we don't need that so uh, here I've just double checked before I click finish so I'm just going back to hypervisor 4 here and going back to hypervisor 4 if it says on just refresh here it will show it as off now just refresh this one okay so uh, I'm just gonna go back to the screen where I was before and that is if I go back to this icon the two windows are still open there so I'm just gonna go back to this screen the finish right completing the move wizard if you have already taken a screenshot of the completing move wizard then we are about to click finito right so click finito okay I've, I've clicked it and uh, I'll just look at the Oh, that okay. So if I go to my machine here, oh, it's already here. That was fast. So see this, it's on three now. So guys, if you see the switch there, your machine was connected to that switch. It is expecting that switch to be on three as well, right? So uh, what you can do is drop down. In your case, if you see the error, drop down and whatever switch is there, that, that's only one switch there, right? Just select that and keep going ahead so select that drop down select that switch which you have and keep going ahead my environment is a bit new so that's why it just went away right there so no new error right and uh, because your machine has an operating system it's gonna take some time mine doesn't have operating system so it finished but then you see that with or without an operating system it works the same way it's just gonna be more time because it's moving the virtual disk as well so and imagine this is just 10 GB disk if it had been 100 GB disk like in production environment it would have taken all night to do that so normally if we have to migrate with the disk so no uh, we then just uh, do it on the weekend and uh, then we just do it on the night and just come back in the morning and then check that okay it's done so if your machine has moved from four to three like this then take a screenshot and that would be your 15th screenshot whoever is successful there and is clearly showing in the, the same machine is clearly showing in uh, your hyper three like this take a screenshot so let me know if it is done for everyone. Sorry? Which is uh, okay uh, as long as they're off right now. Otherwise, yeah, they should be different names. But uh, they're off, right? As long as they're off so guys the one that was reached that got migrated uh, let's just uh, rename it to uh, right click see this uh, is it done for everyone first of all oh, okay okay so because now you see two vm zero ones the one that just got migrated we have to rename it to uh, your first name dash make so guys, whoever's uh, virtual machine has just reached here, 
you know that you can just right click here and rename it to your first name dash mig mig which is migration so whenever it is reached there your first name dash see this just change it to your first name dash mig Well, if you've already taken a screenshot before renaming, it's okay already. So the next one is actually a task, which means I don't help you do it yourself. Good luck. Oh, I mean, like, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so are we all done? Oh, no? Okay. Let me know if it is yes yet. So I guess here, uh, let's just talk about the task, right? Oh, done? No, actually, talk about the task is good. Okay. Okay, so it is yes yet. All right, so let's just talk about the task, which is, of course, uh, uh, you have to put those screenshots uh, there in order to get the marks. So task one, first of all, on uh, your first name zero three hypervisor, uh, power on your first name dash make vm now this time the only difference is you're gonna power on and do exactly the same steps of migration yourself right you're gonna right click that powered on so power on the machine uh, right click it and uh, move Oh, okay. What's the error message? Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, I'm coming there. So uh, I'm just gonna finish this. Uh, create a new uh, folder called uh, your first name, Meg inside the C drive of um, hypervisor finish migration okay take screenshot of this VM successfully migrated to okay so this is a task here and uh, well you get you know that there are two screenshots required here so uh, those were done you're going to start so we are running out of stuff right here, right? So we can just reduce the memory. Yeah, you can start the task, guys. Those were done. Did it work for you? Just power on any one of them other than what you just migrated. 
and then remove the ISO from the DVD on that other machine. Let me know if it doesn't solve it. Okay. So, so can I rename it then? Or keep it as Well, yeah. Task is this. So, guys, uh, you can rename this one because we're about to migrate that, right? You can rename it like this, exactly as you said. Okay. So, we're going to rename it. Yeah, you can just rename it and make one. Okay. 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 Oh, my God. Wait, how did you stop? I just hit power. I didn't We are all good, or? No, it doesn't work. So, we didn't need to do it. So, we didn't need to do it. Thank you. 
computer, you're going to move it to the entrenched thing. That's right. So, let me know if it's done, guys. So, summary page. Do not miss the summary page, guys. The final page before you click finish. Uh, we need a screenshot of that page where your um, in the wizard at the end of the wizard when you're about to click finish to start the wizard. Well. Well, if you click finish, then it's yeah, not there. I did one before just in case, and this is what I have. It, it didn't come up. The summary didn't come up. It just showed. Didn't start then because without the finish. And then it just. Yeah, click finish to start the wizard, Microsoft, right? So before that, guys, anyone was offered summary page? Anyone was shown summary page? You got the summary? No, but uh, it's okay. Because uh, I can show the hyperlink here. Okay, show the success and uh, if it is successfully done, you can take the screenshot and please do mention with the screenshot we talked about, right? So, somebody could not catch something like that, right? So, right now I'm going to forget that after two minutes. I have a very good memory. So. Okay, guys, so, so I hope it is done for everyone. Let's go ahead. Yay. Okay, so the next task is, oh, so everyone is done. Okay. So if you're done with that, uh, we have uh, taken the screenshots there. Uh, now, uh, this was just the... Uh, migration with the machine off and migration with the machine on and you were able to do that both times the thing is that it was uh, it was just moving this way so you when you move the machine the disk has to be moved as well and what you did today was no shared migration right so if you had some more setup done here if you had the sand there then only a machine would have moved and it would have taken a second or less than that to move the machine because the virtual disk never moves if you have a sand solution there right but we don't have a sand solution that's why the virtual machine virtual disk also moved and it was 10 gb so it took time so that's what i want you to know there uh, now let's just go for some uh, uh, other configurations as well so we'll be finished today very soon till 11 30 so uh, let I'm just kidding, come on. It's that precious reaction, you know, that's priceless reaction. At once the eyes are big and ooh. So <laughs> okay, so now the next lab is really um, small lab, but uh, if we start the SQL server, that would be good. Oh, there's a no? Let's do this. All right. Woohoo. Yeah. Oh, okay. Three more. Three more? Yeah. No, we just have 15 done, right? No, we have 17. Oh, yeah. 
two more. Exactly. Sorry. Ew. 17 screenshots. Then we're going to keep on doing the lab without screenshots, but. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so pass through disk is uh, first thing is that what is that concept? So storage of virtualization, we talk about that, and uh, uh, what it has that. First of all, you should know that the virtual machines uh, in Hyper V, the virtual disk extension is always dot vhdx here, uh, and uh, the virtual uh, machine has a. Another file called virtual memory. Then there are many files. Snapshot files are there. So the, the, the main thing to understand here is that virtual machines, virtual disk X is a, just a file, software file, right? So its extension is .vhdx, which means it's a virtual disk, right? So second thing is there are different, uh, uh, you know, uh, features here for uh, the storage of a virtual machine. So uh, storage means just a virtual disk. So there's a pass-through disk. And the purpose of pass-through disk, that's one of the features of the storage of virtual machine here. The virtual machine is given access to a raw disk. Raw disk is that the full disk is available for just one virtual machine. Otherwise, what happens is that the disk, the physical disk is shared by many virtual machines. But pass-through disk is a concept where the virtual machine gets hold of one full disk for performance reasons, right? So it is used for pure IOPS, and what is IOPS? Input, output per second. Uh, so it's, it is used for pure IOPS performance, right? So if you're doing a read and write uh, uh, on the disk, uh, if the application is reading data from the disk and writing data on the disk, so that is called IOPS. So how fast it can read, how fast it can write on the disk, uh, it depends on uh, how good the disk is. If the VM is not getting lots of IOPS when working with its virtual disk, then this solution is mostly adopted, right? So, adopted. Now, if the enterprise application like SQL Server or any other is not performing the read-write tasks on the virtual disk, then this solution is needed. So, the main thing is, if virtual machine needs uh, read and write, especially the read speed, then we go for pass-through disk solution there. So, uh, if I just go back to the diagram here, uh, now suppose this virtual machine is there and there is another virtual machine, uh, well uh, I have a diagram here actually of the rod, okay. Or not. Oh, actually I don't have. So I'll create one here. Hmm. So let us uh, create a pass through disk diagram. Okay, sometimes I change accents. So here, uh, if you go for the pass through disk here, now if you have one hypervisor here, and uh, so this is a uh, hyper, uh, hypervisor, and then you have a virtual disk here as well, which is a local physical disk. Uh, Oh, delay. Physical disk. And then you have a virtual machine here. And that virtual machine is, uh, it has, this is a virtual machine loaded on the memory. And its virtual disk is created on top of a physical disk here. Right, but in one hypervisor, it's not like uh, you will have just one virtual machine on one hypervisor. There will be many virtual machines on one hypervisor according to what kind of RAM and physical RAM and physical CPU and physical disks you have. If you have very good high, uh, a lot of RAM there, a lot of CPU power there, processor power, and a lot of SSD disks there, then you can have as many virtual machines there, right? So. Uh, what happens is, suppose this virtual machine is not performing well in terms of when it is reading the data from the disk. Uh, so th if there is SQL Server application, which is just database application, if that is installed there and it's not performing, so what happens is that you just add a new physical disk here, uh, another physical disk here, second one, and but you don't share that disk with other machines. So what happens is uh, that 
if you have other machines here they all share the disk right physical disk they uh, this machine has its own virtual disk on the physical disk this machine has its virtual disk on the physical disk this machine has virtual disk on the physical disk so but the other disk that you've just purchased there uh, uh, you are only giving access to that one virtual machine to this whole disk here so this is where the password disk comes that the virtual machine one VM gets full access to one disk for performance reasons uh, and uh, for performance of IOPS which is input output per second or uh, also we can say disk read slash writes. So this is a one liner for what is a pass through disk right. So uh, if we have that uh, pass through disk, one VM gets full access to one disk for performance of FireOps discrete writes. So uh, if that's the case and everyone has uh, fully understood what we, I have talked about and uh, you're all nodding yes. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll just imagine that. So uh, we have all understood that. Uh, now let's just go ahead and try to do this lab to understand what we're talking about here. So uh, for pass through disk, we have to go to actually any hypervisor here. And so our virtual machine is right now on hypervisor 4. Yes, right? Actually, it's in both. Uh, you have one virtual machine in hypervisor 3, and you have other virtual machine in hypervisor 4 as well, right? So, uh, Let's go back to hypervisor 3. Hypervisor 3. Now, once you're there in hypervisor 3, uh, you can right click on any of the machine that is turned off, right? I have just one machine here, but you can right click on any of the machines and go to the settings now. So let's go to the settings of any virtual machine. Uh, what we want to see here is, you can see under the SCSI controller, the hard drive, right? This one, hard drive. So if you see the hard drive of any virtual machine's settings here, uh, can you click and select the physical hard disk, this one? Are we able to click and select that or is it grayed out? It's grayed out. Okay. So if it is grayed out, which means that we don't have an extra external physical disk that is uh, that can be made available for any virtual machine that needs it. So it doesn't detect, the virtual machine doesn't detect any physical disk attached to a hypervisor any disk that is empty it has this hypervisor has one disk on top of which the hyper-v is installed but it needs to detect a full empty disk that is not being used by anything else so it doesn't detect that so it shows that the, it is grayed out so take a screenshot here first of all where you cannot you're unable to select the physical disk of whichever virtual machine you selected whichever virtual machine so it doesn't have to be that particular make virtual machine it could be any virtual machine but the main thing is you right click there you went to the settings you click the hard drive section here this one and so this physical hard disk uh, unclickable or grayed out must be showing there so have we taken a screenshot okay so that's your 18th screenshot now after this uh, let's just cancel out from here because we get that okay so we cannot select it right so let's cancel out from it now we're gonna add a physical disk to your hypervisor 3 in a production environment it will be a physical disk you would just uh, buy from the market another disk or order from the market uh, and just go to the server in the data center and just put push that disk inside the drive bay and you will have another disk available so here let's just right click and add another disk here so click settings so right click on hypervisor, go ahead and click settings and then you must see that add button here. We are about to add a hardware. So right click on hypervisor, go to settings. Right click on hypervisor, go to settings. And then click the add button. So once you click the add button, you should see this hard disk, right? If you are all seeing this, click next. SCSI is okay, no problem. Next. Create a new virtual disk is okay. 
next here keep it 60 GB it's okay and single file we're all good right so single file 60 GB next and this is the name of the disk right which is okay doesn't matter so click finito click finish I have clicked the finish so it now shows here right you have a 200 GB disk here and you have a 60 GB disk here so take a screenshot of this your 19th screenshot take a screenshot here it's showing your name anyway so if you have taken a screenshot here then press OK now you have two disks here and one that you just added is empty so once you've added a disk that is not being used by anyone right now so again we go to the same spot where the virtual machine uh, screenshot we took before so right click on the virtual machine actually any virtual machine and go to settings of that virtual machine inside the hypervisor once you're inside and you click that same area of hard drive like this now you see it is clickable but do not click it now you see it is clickable but do not click it why because if you click that you will lose your connection to your virtual hard disk that has your operating system so we want to click this hard disk here now we could create a new disk here there's a new button here right so guys don't go ahead guys don't go ahead keep on this page stay on this page right I'm going to test this first I'm gonna click the new button here and do not do that do not follow me click next do not follow me click next nope that's not it so I'm gonna cancel out from here so stay are, you, are we on this page yes we are on this page so you can see up here add hardware this one do you all see this add hardware so once you do this uh, see this this is already selected on the right side SCSI controller add hardware SCSI controller if you see all that there is a third one the add button so it's the same machine we were on where I asked you not to click that button uh, so on the same machine I'm just clicking add hardware then click this and now go ahead and click the add button everyone's okay right so once you click add now you can see what do you want to add there it's the hard drive that I want to add I hope everyone's seeing this option then go ahead and click add now this is the second SCSI controller and it is asking which disk you want here so this time we know that the first SCSI controller has our disk that has our operating system that has everything we want so the second one now we can go for this one physical disk so now this machine has an access to virtual disk already of course that's where everything is installed but now it has access to a physical disk as well with the help of second SCSI controller and you can install anything here on this machine and it will give you very good performance because it's a raw disk it's a physical disk direct access to the physical disk so you have to take the screenshot where you were able to uh, add the second SCSI controller and you had you were able to click this physical disk go ahead and take a screenshot make sure your name is showing there that's your 20th screenshot that's just one screenshot for this page and that's 20th okay if the screenshot has been taken here we're good this is pass through disk and apply and okay right apply okay now we can go for next very 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 small lab not so we're going to be installing SQL server that's going to take forever just kidding so uh, it's going to take some time so let's go ahead and install so what are we doing now right now we just talked about storage here and one t feature inside the virtual machine storage that is called uh, pass through disk here 
Hmm. Actually, there is another feature called uh, differencing disk, and then we can go for SQL storage installation. So the, this pass-through disk, we understand that it is for performance. It is a raw disk that has been given to a virtual machine. Then there is another one called differential disk. But actually, you know what? Uh, we did not do that with the other class, or did we do that? No, we did not. So, so, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, with another class, we did this uh, install SQL Server to later install ADK 8.1 and SCVMM. So, uh, let's just reach there. So, uh, we're going to still do the differential disk later. Uh, but right now, if we start now, actually, for the other class, they did the whole course of SQL Server with me. So, it was a piece of cake for them. Uh, they could do it with eyes closed and hands uh, behind the back. No. But we're going to do that too. Hopefully, it's going to be nice experience to install a big application. So, guys, now what's the plan here? The plan is that we're going to install SQL Server on Server 2. In order to install that, we don't need the hypervisor 1 and 2 just for this exact lab, right? So, what's the plan then? Uh, because we're going to install SQL Server on the server 2 so what we can do is we can temporarily upgrade the ram we can increase the ram of 0 2 machine here uh, from uh, you know uh, 6 gb to 12 gb right we're gonna shut down the server 2 and increase its ram to 12 gb so first step shut down server 2 second step shut down server 3 and 4 as well why because we're installation of SQL Server has nothing to do with Hypervisor 3 and Hypervisor 4. And we need some more RAM for temporarily for this process, particular process, right? So, uh, I'm just going to write down those steps here now, so you could just follow them. Um, first is that uh, uh, shut down uh, your first name 0, uh, 2, your first name 0, 3, your first name 04 servers and uh, on your first name 02 uh, server change the RAM temporarily uh, to temporarily okay temporarily to 12 GB because we have total of 16 GB now we need as much RAM as possible here so uh, we can, and also on your first name 02. Whoa, what happened? Okay, I'll just copy that. Oh. So on uh, your first name 02 server, uh, let's give it internet connection as well. Internet connection by adding a second nick and uh, putting it to uh, vm net 8 nat in the custom features right so we're going to go through these steps here and then on your 0 to server uh, attach the sql 2014 iso 2 this server's DVD. So these are the steps we need to do. So let's go ahead and start doing that. Um, I'm going to go to the machines here. I'm just going to shut down 02, shut down 03, shut down 04. You may have done that already, right? Uh, 02 is shut down. So, uh, while, well, I need to still make sure that 3 and 4 are shut down, so I could increase the RAM of 2 temporarily. We're going to put it back once it is done, but right now we need that RAM. So, on 02 here, I'm just going down to the memory. I'm going down to the memory lane. No, it's not that. So, I'm just going down to the memory and click that. And just go up to 12 GB. I'm just going to drag it up to 
12416. You can just type it directly or just drag it up there to 12416. So the RAM of server 2 is this and press OK. So now I can see that the shutdown server 2 has this RAM, right? Hey, how'd you know that? You're reading my mind now. I'm scared of you. <laughs> so backspace and screenshot exactly I hope you don't read my mind when I'm about to give marks so and you don't teleport as well right yeah I've seen so many movies now okay. <laughs> too many <laughs> okay so here um, 12 GB we're good so let's power on because we need, as soon sooner we start sooner we're gonna be finished with that Okay, so start this machine now, and hopefully nobody's getting errors. It's good to get that external drive and to secure your virtual machines. Otherwise, there's a lot of problems there later with the uh, harboring systems. So once you're there, just quickly log into your 02 machine. Now you have 12 GB RAM. So whoever hasn't uh, uh, sent me your Gmail and uh, please do send me your Gmail on my college email uh, so I could add you to the video so you could watch the videos. Okay, so I'm logged into this. Uh, now that's the first step here. We change the RAM. Then what we need to do is uh, done. Uh, let's give it internet connection. So let's give it internet connection now and make sure that we see the internet connection. So how do we get it in that? First of all, if I go down here, there's a yellow triangle here. This means it doesn't have internet connection. So let's go up there to the machine two and right click and go to the settings. We need to add a second network card and attach it to VMNet 8 NAT. So let's go right click 02 and click the settings. And so we're not gonna touch this network card. So we're gonna go down to this network card. Well, we're gonna just go down to add button that would help us. So click the add button and you should see this. Go ahead and select the network adapter. I hope everyone's good. And click finito. Well, if you see the, on your left, right side something uh, like uh, what uh, type of bridge to select or what type of network to select, then go for NAT. So click finish. I'm just going to click finish here. Uh, if you click finish here, then I'm still going to connect the VMNet 8 NAT. So already it's on NAT, but I'm just going to go to the custom here. See this custom. And when you drop down, there's this VMNet 8, and that is also NAT. And then click anywhere else, and then click back here. So it shows like this. So we have already selected that. So let's press uh, OK down here. So we have added that. So once we've added that, we have to just make sure do we have internet or not. So just open some site and go to CNN or something. And if you see Trump, this means you have internet. And, uh, Trump? No. Okay. So do not screenshot Trump. So let's go ahead. And oh well, I think because the yellow triangle is gone, this means I have internet connection. So. I'll click there, go to Internet Explorer here, and uh, before, you know, whenever the news site opens, it's Trump. Yes. Okay. Whoa. Okay. So we see that. So we have Internet Connection. Success. So close that. We don't need that Internet Connection. Well, we don't need that Internet Explorer, but we need Internet Connection, of course. So Internet Connection is there. Yes. Second prereq done. Third prereq is... Where is the ISO of SQL 2014? Obviously inside prototype folder, right? So let's attach the SQL 2014 to the DVD of this virtual machine server 2. So uh, I'm just going to go to the virtual machine here and right click on settings of the virtual machine. And then click the CD DVD here. CD DVD. And then 
click use ISO image file obviously we know how to attach that so click browse and go to the C drive prototype folder browse well now my folder structure is different yours is different I'm working in a laptop so I'll just go for my own so go to C drive prototype folder and you should be seeing there um, anything SQL and 2014 this one so if everyone sees this one then double click I hope everyone's seeing that anyone not seeing let me know so double click and uh, guys one more thing here make sure that your two boxes are checked here connected connected power on uh, so you've selected it you've checked the two boxes here press ok should it say D driver's yeah, so mine was in D, so it's okay. Yours in C, it's okay. So that's it, guys. Uh, so if you're done, press okay. Let's continue. If you have this uh, blue bar here, press yes. Even if you press no, it's okay. Doesn't matter. So now we need to launch that uh, SQL Server installation. So uh, let's go down to the yellow folder of this machine, the File Explorer. Let's open the File Explorer here now and go to this PC. And then, well, let's just go down to this PC and double click that D drive. So you should be seeing on the D drive like this, SQL 2014 X64 ENU. So double click that and if the yes no comes here, click yes. And you should be seeing the page for SQL Server 2014 installation. We, oh, did you check box the, those two? check boxes <laughs> okay so I hope you're on this page I hope everyone's on this page yes no maybe okay yes so let's go for on the left side do you see this installation so we're not gonna be planning the this we're gonna start deploying it right now so that's why we need to go to the installation page and then you see that new SQL Server standalone installation or add features to an existing session. So it's a new SQL Server standalone. So yes, that's exactly what we're doing. Let's click this option. So guys, uh, at the end of this, you see complete here. That's the summary page, right? So we need this <laughs> we need this screenshot for the summary page <clears throat> that's for everyone <clears throat> okay so yeah now uh, this the last one is that but anyway uh, first of all do you see this product key here we all see that so do not see my don't watch my product key look there just kidding okay so click next well product key is already built in right so click next now you see the license agreement here I accept the license terms we don't need to send error reporting there, so keep it unchecked. So click next. Now it's going to check from internet the latest updates for SQL Server, which is okay, otherwise it's not gonna let us go ahead. That's why we have internet connection. So select this option and click next. And do we all see the error like this? No. Hey, that's not fair. Okay, if I get there, then you should also get there. Okay, just kidding. So I'm just gonna click check again here. I'm gonna click check again. And checking for updates. I think I have internet, yes, I have internet connection. No yellow triangle here. So, yep, it's okay, guy. So I have also green for everyone. So click next. So be careful here, some of the pages, we have to carefully select some extra options there. So be careful on this installation. Now, till now, we we'll straightforward setup role is SQL Server feature installation, which is good. Yes, that's what we want. And click next. Now, this page, feature selection. So one screenshot coming here. Now, I have to just make it a little bigger. So I'm just going to go for full screen here. This one, full screen and uh, make this page also 
full screen. Okay, so that's how it's looking like here. Now what we need to do is, we need to select the database engine here, database uh, engine services. Also, we need to select these two guys. Management tools basic, management tools complete. So one up there, two down here. We need a screenshot of these three options selected. So that's your 20 second screenshot. So if this screenshot has been taken with three so options uh, selected here, then click next. Whoa, where's my next? Oh, there it is. So next here, and then comes the, well, feature rules. Uh, seriously, okay. Okay, so here, uh, again, there, these are some careful steps I had. Uh, now, Microsoft.NET Framework 3.5 sort of spec 1 is supposed to be there. It has failed for everyone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you do that? It's uh, pretty simple. We need to stay on this page first of all. I'm just going to minimize that. Uh, but we're going to not close this page. Just minimize this page. Once we minimize this page, we can go to the server manager to do the installation of .NET Framework 3.1. But there is one more thing here. 3.5, I guess. So, one more thing. Before we go to the server manager there, uh, we have to temporarily attach the Windows 2012 R2 ISO to the DVD of this. Right now, SQL Server 24 DVD is attached. So, temporarily, just for some time, just for, for the duration of this insertion, right-click here. First of all, change the ISO back to ISO of Windows Server 2012 because it needs some uh, files from that ISO. It, without that, it's not going to install that. So right click here and temporarily go to the DVD and simply attach the Windows 2012 ISO back there again. So I'm just going to click browse here. Could we also just make another CD drive? Well, that would be another good option. It's going to take some longer steps. One step? Oh, how is it one? So, okay. Click cancel. Have you all selected it already or click cancel? Oh, so have we all selected this 2012? Or is it still SQL Server? I hope it's SQL Server. So guys, uh, yeah, we can add a second DVD here. That's a good idea. So we can just go down to add. And do we see this? So click that and click finito. Now we have two DVDs here. The second DVD, so for we all got this second DVD. Okay, so once we got the second DVD, it's easy. Just go back to the use ISO image, go browse to your C drive, prototype folder. Just select Windows 2012 R2. But we need to see what drive uh, letter it got inside. So click browse first of all and uh, just go to your C drive prototype folder. I'm just going to my folder structure here. So on first DVD we have still SQL Server. On the second DVD now we have that uh, 2012 so that's a very good point thank you for that uh, and uh, I'm just gonna press OK after you have just given this uh, path here go ahead and press OK but we still need to check which drive letter it got so if you've pressed OK to that just go down to the file explorer here the yellow folder and check which drive letter you got there I got E I got E right E. Okay, if you got E, so now just uh, uh, the next steps are we have to be careful. Don't go out of me. So if it is E, just make sure that now you're on server manager. Go to the dashboard on server manager and click add rows and features. We are about to install .NET Framework 3.5. So click add rows and features. It's a feature. So we're going to go straight to the features page, which is the fifth one. Next. Nothing here. Next. Nothing here. Just the server name. Make sure it's 02 showing there. Next. 
and nothing on the roles page it is on the features page so next one so I hope everyone's on this page and as soon as you select this one that's what we wanted to install so go ahead and select this one and click next and don't go ahead don't go ahead from here do not touch anything here so the thing is that if you click install it's gonna give you an error so we have to specify an alternate source path here click that alternate specify an alternate source path and it needs to have access to this folder to get some files that are already not available to it so it's gonna get some extra files from this path inside the DVD and uh, we're just gonna exactly put this path because our drive letter for D drive second uh, DVD is E so E comes backslash and inside that Windows 2012 is a subfolder called sources actually it's in the root of the DVD and then the subfolder called SXS now this is the path it needs to install .NET Framework 3.5 any other way it's gonna give you an error so if you have done this hey I was thinking of not taking it but since he mentioned that so let's take a screenshot now oh, so grab it after the class <laughs> so but yeah now I have two screenshots left and that's not fair so here okay if you have done this press ok and click install install so now after this is successfully done we can still continue with the installation of SQL Server I still need to keep one uh, you know last screenshot as the 24 so 25th could be your smiling my uh, you know uh, picture of you and the uh, I'm sure you were putting that in the other previous labs no. last one should be uh, your smiling no oh okay no this shows that you really enjoyed this lab so much that you had to put your selfie there with smiling with a smile or maybe yawning yeah <laughs> Yeah. The bigger the yawn, the more marks. Okay. So, well, it's not done for me. Oh, it's done. So, if it is done, installation succeeded on this. If you see that, click finito or click close, actually. So, let's just go for close if it is done. And we were on that page already. So, go down to the second icon there where we are still on this page, right? and there's a rerun yes there's a rerun written there click that now it's going to detect if it has that and it's green well it's just going to go to the next page everyone on the next page right okay so you see that there's an instance of uh, sql server that is installing that is uh, uh, the default first instance of the sql server is always called ms sql server instance is just one full sql server you can have second instance as well that would be a separate uh, independent sql server but we're just installing one sql server here so default instance okay no change here click next And then it asks for it's a server configuration, but it's asked for which service needs what kind of credentials here, right? So we can go for our domain admin. Let's just put the domain admin here and its password here, and let's put domain admin here and its password here, and we'll keep it as manual and automatic as it is there by default. So here for SQL Server Agent and SQL uh, Server Database Engine. Let's just change that. So I'm just going to click drop down here and then click browse here. I think the screen is too big. Oh, it opened here. So it's your name admin. When you're putting that, always, always check name and press OK. Once you have put that admin the next screen you have to click on that screen and it will let you put the password there as well so your class password small abc capital c four two three or whatever password you put so 
Then I'm going to do the same thing for the second line. That is for SQL Server Database Engine. I'm going to give it highest privileges here. In production environment, normally we create separate accounts for that. We don't do that in production environment. Here, it's just to keep everything simple so we can concentrate on understanding what we're doing. So let's just go there to your name admin and check name here as well. <coughs> and press OK. And just click on top of this and it's going to let you put the password. If you have put in the password, then let's click next. Let's go down and click next. I, if your username password are correct, you, it will let you go ahead. Next. So now this screen has come which is database engine configuration, server configuration is showing there, it is showing windows authentication mode here, but down here for some if it is smaller window, you won't be able to see that, just uh, add current user, so go to the right side and scroll down a little until you see add current user here, uh, so I've just made it a big window here, so it's uh, just showing me this section, so click this button of add current user, once you do that it looks like this. So if everyone's done, click next. Feature configuration rules is the next one. Ooh, so it goes to ready to install. Yep. So take a screenshot here. That will be your 24th. So guys, uh, this is uh, the screenshot that you need and one more screenshot when it shows all green The end of it when it is successfully installed. It's going to show a window with all green services there and everything is successfully installed If it's a success screen don't miss that that will be your 25th or last screenshot, right? So uh, If you have taken a screenshot of this ready to install that's it. Let's click install So now it's showing the progress. <laughs> Do not miss the last screenshot, which is the successful installation of SQL Server. That will show you all green lines for all the services. So yeah, you must take that final screenshot as 25th. So it's a sad occasion that you won't be able to put your selfie there. But uh, you can have a 26th screenshot as your selfie. Well, that could be your mini break as well. In fact, uh, let me just open that. That was funny. Uh -huh. Okay. Hmm, <laughs> that is something really funny, right?
Okay, so... that oh, no. uh oh there's another no anyone else got an error oh no error oh then oh no there's no error oh Okay, so insertion is going on, and let's check it out. So, you got an error? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, that's it, right? What does it say? another lab? Okay, nice try.
Well, that was supposed to be two. What's two? Oh, it's already done. Okay, if it's already done, guys, so what we need to do is shut down, and uh, next time we're good to have the cap Oh, it's, somebody's already gone. Hey, that's not fair. <laughs> He's out. All right.